Welcome to Masterminds and Maintenance, a podcast for those with new ideas in maintenance. I'm your host, Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Each week, I'll be meeting with a guest who's had an idea for how to shake things up in the maintenance and reliability industry. Sometimes the idea failed, sometimes it made their business more successful, and other times their idea revolutionized an entire industry. Today, I'm super excited. We've got Anna Goodman on the show, where we'll discuss her journey into maintenance and reliability. Anna has spent approximately nine years working in maintenance and reliability at DuPont to Honeywell, from the nuclear industry, sugar industry, plastics, chemical processing, all the way to the oil and gas industry. Anna is a mechanical engineer by training and is currently a reliability engineer at Arms Reliability. Anna, warm, warm welcome to the show. I'm super excited to be chatting with you. Thank you. (laughs) Of course. So to kick things off, what I always love to do is I would love to learn more about your story, your background, and how you got started in this uh, interesting little industry and niche. Okay. Um, well, I, uh, I started out in the Midwest, so I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and that's where I went to college. And then uh, right out of school, pretty much, I ended up uh, getting a, a job at a nuclear facility uh, owned by Honeywell. And within that, there was a lot of politics to start out, especially for a first job, right? <laughs> being nuclear and being uh, you know, regulated by not only OSHA, but the NRC, there was a lot to learn. Um, and when I started with them, they were actually on a lockout uh, with their, their union. So what the deal was, was that they had us, uh, they had about a group of 20 of us engineers come in at once around the time of this lockout. And we were helping contractors run the facility until the union members came back. And once they came back, we helped requalify them and then transitioned into process engineering roles. So there was a lot of hands-on learning, a lot of process learning and, and that whole adventure <laughs> and uh and what was even more interesting about it is it's not it wasn't your typical what you would cons- think of as a nuclear plant it was a it made the fuel for the power plants so we actually converted uh uf uh four into uf6 by adding fluorine to it and cylinderized it and then shipped it to the nuclear power plants to then for them to do their thing wow. so that was kind of my first role um and then uh, after a fashion, because it was an older facility, it was started in like the 1950s. Um, the NRC came in after Fukushima happened and did a, an audit on the place. And because it was in Illinois on a fault line and so old, they said you have to do a lot of structural updates. And as a result of those structural updates cost, they laid off about 60% of their task force. And a lot of that was these new engineers that they hired in the group and myself included. And so from there, you know, you go to the job hunt and you see what you can find. And um, I ended up uh, landing a gig with DuPont. They, it was actually a DuPont acquisition. They had bought a Danisco sugar plant mm-hmm. in uh, Thompson, Illinois. And I ended up being what DuPont called a mechanical integrity quality assurance engineer. And what that meant for that plant, because it was an acquisition, is I was starting a lot of mechanical integrity, uh, a lot of the mechanical integrity program from the ground up. And I was also working a lot with maintenance, with the mechanics and technicians, trying to figure out how to incorporate their legacy knowledge into this corporate mandate to follow DuPont policies and procedures, right? Kind of find a happy, good place for everybody to work together and for all that to work together nicely. I learned a lot there. There was a, there was a, a whole lot to learn. I, I, uh, I had a, quite a few mentors on the site as well as, you know, senior DuPont engineers that wanted to see that site become successful. And after a, a while, though, I got sick of the cold, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I asked to be transferred. And so uh, they transferred me to the Orange facility, uh, the Orange DuPont facility. And they're, um, they're on Chemical Row. I don't know if you're familiar. And uh, it's this whole, it's this long street of just plant after plant after plant and uh and dupont happened to be one of them and what they made there were a lot of uh, copolymers so mm-hmm. i was in a plastics uh facility and with within that job i transferred from the miqa world to a reliability engineer but because the facility there was so much bigger and they had so much better resources i was able to expand my knowledge of the their programs into their application 
uh, learn more about what a good condition-based uh, monitoring, you know, schedule and route look like. I was able to achieve a couple of certifications uh, in uh, thermography and lubrication and vibration and that kind of thing. Um, and I learned a, a whole lot uh, from the technicians there as well about not only those uh, sciences, but how to apply them. And then they also had their own lab, which I thought was the best about that facility. They had their own lab where they did failure analysis in on, in that lab. So if a, if a hose failed or a valve failed or gears or whatever it was, um, they, they took basically the carnage and they took it to the lab and they dissected it and they figured out whether it was the metal or lubrication or something else going on with it. And, uh, and so that was fascinating. After about uh, two years or two years there, um, I decided to come closer to a big city. So I started looking for jobs near Houston and uh, I ended up uh, at a Taiwanese owned place called LCY Elastomers where basically they were making rubberized copolymers. And there, I, uh, my title was maintenance engineer, but my role was reliability, mechanical integrity, small <laughs> capital project, you know, jack of all trades, right? Yeah. I was the only mechanical engineer on the site and they pretty much used me wherever they, they could. And so I was very busy, very hopping around. And so I was able to apply a lot of that knowledge that I had learned at all these previous roles, right? And and then about a whole new process. And so that was exciting, especially considering that particular facility was the only uh, division in the Americas. There all the other uh, factories were in Taiwan or other places. And so when they came to the, the Baytown location from Taiwan, some of the other engineers, we were able to, uh, you know, get a lot of teamwork going to make things better in that way. And of course, there were some uh, language and culture barriers that you know you have when that happens but uh, to me it just added to the experience and then from there I, uh, I kind of made a decision for my personal life that I, I didn't necessarily want to be on site all the time and on call and all that stuff right so so now I work for arms and consulting and I've uh, I've been working a lot more on the implementation side um, there again of, of strategies and optimization of those reliability um, technologies and, and things that I learned from previous roles. That's awesome. So it sounds like you kind of got thrown into the deep end and then over time, <laughs> you, you kind of, it, it sounds like you, you just weaved yourself into this uh, reliability space and it sounds like it's become a, a strong passion of yours uh, over uh, the, the last few, few years. Yeah, yeah, I would say so, because cause to me, what I learned through all the different transitions and meeting all the different people and, and working in all the different, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, types is that at the end of the day, like reliability is about the people and is about keeping the people safe and not having equipment surprises that could lead to, you know, uh, injuries or fatalities and, and working together as a team across maintenance and even between maintenance and operation and all that. I mean, the interworkings are incredibly um, detailed, but when they're working smoothly, it's a beautiful thing to see. Absolutely. Well, Anna, I would love to talk about a potentially touchy so subject today, but I think it's a subject that not many people um, commonly address. And it's really this idea that maintenance and reliability from at least what I've seen is traditionally a more male dominated sector. And I'm curious, Anna, working in this sector in maintenance and reliability, could you tell us a little bit more about what it's like um, working in the space as a woman? Uh, yeah, um, I've, I've been doing it for a while. Um, I, and one word I would just say challenging. It really is. Um, but it's, for me, it's a challenge accepted sort of thing. Um, <laughs> You know, sometimes it seems like, you know, you, the men and the women are speaking completely different languages. You know, you, you may use the same terms, but the way you describe things may be a little, a little different. And so it becomes a little clouded. Um, you know, to me in that it's always, be it's become crucial to just, when that happens, to come back, like to step back and to try to gain that understanding and convey things in a different way and really have, you know, patience with the people that you're working with to, to know and to understand that you all have the same common goal and the same, and, you know, and so you work together that way. In my experience, you know, one example of that could be some men do have a very clear cut way of thinking 
uh, that things can only be successful if it's done one way and it's the way they've always done it and they see no reason to change. And, you know, not just women, but I think the younger generation is working a lot on trying to change that and change that mindset. And so while this could be true for from a technical perspective, sometimes giving a more emotionally intuitive spin could get things done faster or better with, in conjunction with other work and improved teamwork can be just as uh, effective or better than the technology in the, in the long run as a solution. Yeah. Absolutely. So what I hear, Anna, is that it's not so much about, it, it has to do with trying to change the mindset of people who have been in the industry for a very long time and, and making sure that the case that we bring, you know, as let's call it the younger generation is worth listening to. Yeah. Um, Anna, I'm also curious, do you have any advice for women working in maintenance and reliability today? or also women who are pursuing or thinking about pursuing careers um, in this field? Yeah, I would say uh, for women in the field right now, I would say the key thing I've learned on the job is while a title may earn a lot of respect, uh, compassion and attention to details earn trust. And these can be essential mm. in creating a good work environment for yourself. And then for women who are considering pursuing the field, I think I would encourage to realize that there are some differences between theory and application, right? The theories that we learn in school, while they're validated in math and science, you need more finesse in the application. And when developing a project or program, you make sure you have all the pieces un understood and not just the one you have to focus on and are responsible for. Yeah. And then I would even go maybe a step further in saying, you know, I think that a, a pivotal um, thing in, you know, building confidence as an engineer is just knowing that mistakes happen. If you admit them, fix them if you can, learn from them, try to be better the next time, you're really going to build yourself up for success instead of failure. Were, was there like a pivotal experience for you that, that made you realize like, hey, I can do this and I can not just do this well, but I can do this, you know, to the best of my capabilities, better than everyone else? I, I wouldn't say there was necessarily a pivotal experience, but maybe just the, 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 biggest, um, the biggest gap I had to, to cover was when I went from a nuclear facility that I had operated and was very familiar with mm -hmm. to that sugar plant where I was leading an effort to change a plant that was very set in its ways from, uh, and I was getting direction not only from the plant about the old ways, but I was getting direction from DuPont about their ways and to just work with both sides and realize what was truly needed and kind of filter through a lot of the the, the mess. You know, um, it just, it, it taught me a lot about, you know, there again, that cool theory versus application. So in theory, you're supposed to do A, B, C, D, right? And this is the procedure and this is the corporate way to do it. But in application, maybe C and, C don't, C and D don't apply. Maybe those regulatory bodies don't go. So you don't want to force a square peg into a round hole, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm super curious. What was one thing that was really impactful to you when you're just moving to the sugar facility, when you had to change the, uh, the mindsets of a bunch of people that had been doing things a certain way. What was the most, uh, what, what was one thing that really worked for you? Being a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that was the big thing that, that really saved me because sometimes what people say, there's, there's another level of what mm -hmm. they mean. And if you don't grasp that right away, it could end up in conflict instead of compromise. Um, you know, when they're like, this is the way we've done it for 30 years and there's no way I'm going to change it. This is stupid, you know, and, and they're getting all fired up. If, if you can, you know, calm them down and be like, I hear you. I understand. I understand that this part doesn't make sense. So therefore, the part that doesn't make sense, we're not going to apply. We're just going to leave that to the side and we're going to focus on what does make sense. And a lot of the time when you appeal to them that way, a lot of the, the crazy kind of goes away. <laughs> <laughs> I think you bring up such a good point because at the end of the day, re maintenance, reliability, while you're working with large machinery and equipment, it's people that are operating it. It's people that are, are the ones turning wrenches, putting it up back up online and people have emotions and connecting with people, understanding the, the why behind, you know, the, the frustration is always so, so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
I'm, I'm curious, like we, we talked about, you know, you, you mentioned in the very beginning that, you know, it, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that, that you accept. Um, I'm also curious, flipping the coin the other direction, if you could give any of your male colleagues any advice when working with women, um, what would, what's something that you'd want to share? Or what, what's one thing that would make it easier for more women to come into this space and field? Um, I would say that the best men I've worked with is who I would probably try to glean from the most with that. And so they, they were never afraid to admit when they were wrong or to learn something new. And it's not a sign, and to know that it's not a sign of vulnerability, but a sign of growth. I mean, that's something that I even have to remember myself sometimes, you know, to, to kind of try to, to, to make sure to put the ego to the side and, and, and focus on the things that truly matter within a, a project or a program or whatever it is you're working on. That applies to everyone. It doesn't matter, male or female. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter what color, what, what color <laughs> skin you have. It doesn't matter what, whether you have an accent or not. That, I think that right. applies to, right. to everyone. And I'm curious, who inspired you? Who influenced you to become the, the leader in maintenance reliability that you are today? Um, honestly, I, uh, I think I wouldn't be able to say that it was just one person. Um, you know, if I had to kind of break it down over my life, I would say, you know, my dad helped me uh, encourage, or he encouraged in me the love of science. You know, my mom, she loves people and she's always been a very compassionate, empathetic woman. Um, you know, and those two things are very influent, were very influential on me when I was growing up. And then, you know, in high school, there was a, a German teacher that helped me uh, learn how the, the human brain works and how better understanding that can lead to success in other ways. Um, and then in, in the field and in, in the jobs that I've done, uh, there's a gentleman named Dan Haig that taught me how to keep a good work-life balance and how that's the key to get it to any job, right? And uh, there was this guy, another guy, I think I mentioned in one of my blogs, Olin Peppel, who Pull, sorry, that uh, always was looking to better himself, you know, even if that meant going way out of his comfort zone, you know, he, he started out as a welder. And by the time I was there, he was running stores, and he actually transitioned into the maintenance superintendent. So I mean, to, to go that far in the career of 20, 20 years is, you know, amazing and very rare. And it's because he was able, he was willing to do that. And then I think the, the most recent one was probably my friend Charlie Block that taught me uh, that knowing the answer isn't as important as knowing where to find it or, you know, knowing where, who to talk to, um, you know, or just kind of checking it out. Don't be afraid to ask those questions that some people are afraid to ask because you know, the worst thing that they'll say is no. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And it sounds like you have such a positive attitude. It sounds like you've gone through a lot of different experiences where you got thrown into the deep end, but it also sounds like you've been supported by so many different people that have helped along the way. And I think that's what makes um, all of us so successful. It's never a one person show. It's, it's everyone that we've learned from, everyone that we can turn to ask questions to uh, and push us to be better. Um, you know, Anna, you, you've worked at so many different industries across oh, uh, gas, sugar, manufacturing, nuclear power plants, and now you're on the consulting side. I must imagine you see so many different uh, experiences, challenges with different organizations. I'm curious, is there like one that stands out to you, one common challenge that you kind of see time and time again, regardless of industry that you uh, go into? <laughs> yes, I would say um, I wish more people outside of the maintenance and reliability groups understood that in order to not have surprises, equipment health has to be maintained and monitored by more than just mechanics and technician when the equipment is down. In order to take the best care of the equipment, many techniques and eyes have to be applied in an optimal way to ensure that the design of the equipment is holding up to expectation, and if not, we must work as a team to eliminate these issues. And priority has to be on reliability for it to become a reality. Because if it's not your priority, it's just gonna you're, you're gonna continue to see the same failures until you you do something to change that. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, you know, a lot of people have this idea of maintenance and reliability, but they're not putting a priority to it. So it sounds like 
you, you often see people let it slip through the, the wayside and you kind of forget about it. Um, I'm curious, like, what are some of the impacts that that has? The biggest one is dollars. Um, yeah. You know, when you're when you're taking things down too frequently because it's failing, that's money. That's money to fix it. That's money for parts. That's money for downtime. It, um, optimizing that is is key, and to also not waste on the other side. If you're looking at something too often, that can be a big resource and money waster there too. So it's just a uh, you know, if you if you're able to look at things in a more high level and then deconstruct it to the smallest thing and optimize, that's that's you know that's the key thing to to save those money and resources. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Anna, you know, I've learned so much. It sounds like you've learned so much from your mentors. Um, do you have a favorite book that you read and learn from? whether it's related to maintenance and reliability or something <laughs> completely different too. I actually um, have two for this one. So on the professional side, uh, reliability centered maintenance the, by John Mowbray, I think it's uh, M-O-U-B-R-A-Y. I don't okay. know how you would say that exactly, uh, but that's a really good one. It, it talks, it breaks down all the basics. It gives you uh, the connection between the mathematical statistics and the science that is put into all the optimization and an analysis that you hear about. And it really, um, it really is a, a good, a good book for that. And then on the life side of things, I would say one book that I read recently that really has had a big impact on my life is called Unlearn, 101 Simple Truths for a Better Life. And it's by a guy named Humble the Poet. And it really just breaks down some of the myths and legends that we tend to, to carry in our life that if we could just unlearn them, we would be liberated in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> Any highlights for that you could share with us, Anna? <laughs> um, I think one is, you know, sometimes we focus uh, a lot on what we think matters, mm -hmm. right? We have this list in our head of, this matters and this matters. And so sometimes it's hard to prioritize that. Yeah. And one way that he, or one thing that he talks about is that the true prioritization comes in what you spend time on. Yeah. So like if people you say matter to you, you have to take the time to, to spend time with them. If, you know, there's something that you want to learn, you're never going to learn it if you don't spend the time to, to practice it and to do it. So. Yeah. That's so interesting because now I'm thinking back, about what's the most common mistake that you had mentioned around maintenance and reliability. It was this idea that, you know, we say maintenance reliability is really important, but are we actually practicing what we preach? And to your point, are we spending the time exactly to actually show that it is a true priority? That's a, that's, I think a really good takeaway that a lot of people can, can mm -hmm. learn from and myself included too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anna. I've, I've personally learned so much. Uh, could you share with all of our listeners the different ways that they could connect with you and learn from you on, on your journey through maintenance and reliability? Uh, yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to just look up Anna Goodman, I'm, um, I'm probably the only one on there with brightly colored hair. I have bright orange hair in my, my profile photo. Um, and if, if that's not accessible to you or you don't have a profile, um, my email address is agoodman at armsreliability.com. I'd be more than willing to have any kind of, uh, you know, conversations that you, or quite answer any questions or concerns in regards to reliability and maintenance, or maybe even how my, my company could, could help you out if, uh, if you're in need. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for joining us. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to today's Masterminds and Maintenance. My name is Ryan Chan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. You can also connect with me. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You can also reach me directly at ryan at onupkeep.com. Until next time. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you.